the son of a doctor. Michael Boyd was born in Belfast and raised in London. At age 16, his family moved to Edinburgh, home of the great International Theatre Festival. When he was 22, Michael sought out the legendary Russian director, Anatoly Efros, whose work he had seen at the Edinburgh Festival. Efros invited him to train at Moscow's Malaya Brunyaya Theatre. It was 1978. Russia was under the iron control of Brezhnev. There was always a KGB officer observing rehearsals. For Michael, theatre could never have seemed more urgent and necessary. Returning to the United Kingdom, Michael became the founding artistic director of Tron Theatre. Under his leadership, the Tron established itself as a powerhouse of both new writing and dynamic productions of classics. Among Michael's highlights was his landmark direction of Macbeth, starring Ian Glenn, which London's Observer called the most exciting revival of Macbeth since Judi Dench and Ian McKellen. In 1996, Michael became Associate Artistic Director of the RSC. His staging of A Midsummer Night's Dream was described as the best since Peter Brooks. It boldly and brilliantly restores sex, excitement, and danger to a play that can be bland and staid. He then tackled Shakespeare's earliest works about the War of the Roses, the three Henry VI plays, and Richard III. Typically, actors today commit to one play for a short period of time. But for this epic project, Michael wanted actors who would deeply investigate the world of these four histories and Shakespeare's language. He brought together an ensemble of 29 actors playing over 100 roles. He increased rehearsal time to 17 weeks. They performed 13 hours of drama, what Alastair Macaulay described in his review as the tragic mirror pattern of fathers mourning sons and sons their fathers. When Michael won the Olivier Award for Best Director, in his acceptance speech, he celebrated the actors. Part of Michael's art as a director is a magnificent sense of theatrical space. In 2002, he directed The Tempest for the RSC at the Roundhouse, a former London train station, in which Michael and his set designer, Tom Piper, pressed the limits of space vertically and horizontally, but also maintained an intimacy with the audience. The actors played in close-up on a ledge, running around the front seats, and their closeness made the language palpable. The company also employed circus skills, and they ascended and descended on ladders and ropes. The staging was exhilarating, but what made this a great production for Michael Billington of London's Guardian was that it was political and about gaining self-knowledge. When he became artistic director in 2003, his vision is that a Shakespeare company should parallel a mind as open and as deep as that of Shakespeare's. Michael again championed ensembles. 36 actors played four Shakespeare tragedies, including Michael's staging of Hamlet starring Toby Stevens. It was Michael's first production as artistic director, it was a triumph, and Toby Stevens, magnificent. Meanwhile, a second ensemble of 20 actors performed four rarely produced plays by Shakespeare's contemporaries in Spain, plays from the Spanish Golden Age. In 2006 came the RSC's fantastic Complete Works Festival, in which for the first time all of Shakespeare's 37 plays, long poems, and sonnets were performed by 30 visiting companies from across the world. Highlights included the Japanese Ninagawa Company's Titus Andronicus, an Indian Midsummer Night's Dream, and Theatre for New Audiences' Merchant of Venice, starring F. Murray Abraham. In 2007, Michael began a two-year project to stage all of Shakespeare's eight history plays, from Richard II to Richard III, performed by the same ensemble over two and a half years. He restaged the three Henry VI plays and Richard III from 2000 and joined them with a new production of the second tetralogy of history plays, Richard II, Henry IV, parts one and two, and Henry V. What made the project incredible came in spring 2008 when all eight plays were performed back to back, nearly 24 hours of drama over a weekend called the glorious moment. 
It was a huge achievement for the RSC, won three Oliviers, and was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to behold a marathon of English history as Shakespeare envisioned it. Michael also led the company through the successful transformation of its main Royal Shakespeare Theatre. No longer a proscenium arch theatre, it now has a thrust stage which halves the distance from the stage to the furthest seat to only 15 metres, bringing actors and audiences much closer together. In 2008, Michael created his largest ensemble. 44 actors worked together over three years, rehearsing and performing seven plays. In the summer of 2011, under the auspices of Lincoln Center Festival and the Park Avenue Armory in association with Ohio State University, this ensemble came to the heart of New York. They also brought their own theater. They performed As You Like It, staged by Michael, King Lear, Romeo and Juliet, Julius Caesar, and A Winter's Tale, in repertory in a unique reconstruction of the Royal Shakespeare Theatre Auditorium within the Park Avenue Armory. In his final season as artistic director, the RSC is producing the World Shakespeare Festival for the Olympics in London, a worldwide celebration of Shakespeare. The festival will include artists from around the world pushing the boundaries of performance and reflecting the cultural shifting of our world through Shakespeare's plays that speak across geographies and generations. As well as classics, Michael has always championed new writing. Returning to his roots in the autumn of 2012, he will direct an adaptation by Adrian Mitchell of Pushkin's epic novel, Boris Gudunov, in the RSC's Swan Theater as part of The World Elsewhere, a season looking at 16th century Russia, China, and Italy. Why was Shakespeare Shakespeare? He was, he, as I say, he was born into a time of extraordinary uh, crisis, the passing of the Middle Ages of faith and the birth of uh, a new age of skepticism, uh, a mercantile age. Uh, he was born particularly in England at a time of... Uh, a, a, a brutal and very, very fast revolution of the sacking of all the Catholic churches, the removal of the Virgin Mary, the destruction of all images. In Stratford, we have the church where Shakespeare's buried, Holy Trinity. Um, you can still see the scars of that decision to take away all those graven images. Mm. Um, and he was himself from a, a, a Catholic background. And he... He managed to deal with crisis and not get into jail like Thomas Kidd, Ben Jonson. Most of his contemporaries got into terrible trouble. Christopher Marlowe was assassinated. How did Shakespeare survive? That's one of the things that makes Shakespeare Shakespeare. He survived. He, and one of the main ways that he both survived and became so good was that unlike say, Christopher Marlowe or Ben Jonson, who couldn't keep the author out of it, couldn't keep the editorial out of their plays. Shakespeare hid the editorial in dialogue. And the truth lies like something out of the Da Vinci Code, somewhere in between two characters. And the play happens there, mysteriously, but with clarity and with great power. And his ability to dramatize the split, whether it's the split between being a country boy in Stratford or, and, and the court in London, whether it's the split between Catholic and Protestant, whether it's the split, uh, as I say, between the age of faith and the age of rationalism and mercantilism, um, whether it's the split between the old Anglo-Saxon and, the, and, and, and the, the Latin of the language of power. He sets them up, gets them talking to each other, and he never judges either side. If there's a judgment, because if he did, people would know what his editorial was and they could silence him. The editorial, if it's there, is so wrapped up 
in the nature of his writing that it becomes good art, in that it's indivisible from its form. Whereas a contemporary Ben Jonson wrote beautifully, but it was an essay. Christopher Marlowe wrote stunningly, but it was a series of monologues. Um, Eminem and Jay-Z are brilliant, highly metrical, rhyming, relevant, passionate writers. They're monologues. They're not, and they're, they're editorials. They're not capable in the way that Shakespeare was of creating this. It's not a hologram. It's something much more profound than that. It's something that actually almost approaches the condition of life in between the opposites of Shakespeare's existence, both as a person and, uh, uh, and as an artist. I would say it is that duality in Shakespeare that is the fundamental DNA of his greatness.